Welcome to a new episode of Hanging Out Right with Chuck Graney and John Martinez. And we're very excited to have uh, some great guests with us today. Chuck, who do we have with us? We've got Dr. Randall Kurtz, chiropractor, <clears throat> and great apartment for looking close, Greg Irwin. That's right, Greg Irwin. So, Randall Kurtz, Dr. Randall, could you please uh, tell us where, you're, where you are in the uh, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Randy Kurtz. As you've heard, I am a chiropractor and acupuncturist in private practice just outside of Chicago in my 21st year. And I have uh, written a book called The Basis Guide to Injury Management, Prevention and Better Health, in which I talk about uh, how basis in particular can avoid injury, uh, common things like tendonitis, back pain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I am a basis, so I come from that perspective and uh, fortunate to uh, have a lot of uh, great friends in the music business and uh, treat a lot of musicians in my practice, which is my passion. And um, and because uh, of my association with you gentlemen, I am here today and happy to be so. Yeah. Don't you, uh, do you, are you, do you have a regular column and, and bass player? Uh, yeah, I do video columns uh, every month for Bass Musician Magazine, for the International Society of Bassists, and for Making Music Magazine out of Canada, in which uh, for Making Music I do a general uh, musician's wellness sort of thing, like stretch of the month, or this month we'll be talking about health for keyboardists or, or things like that. Uh, and I have some, some magazines that I do columns for too. So I keep busy with that, yeah. Great, great. And we also have with us Mr. Greg Irwin, who I had uh, the pleasure of meeting while we were, actually we met before in, in Nashville, but we really got to hang out in China uh, my last tour there. Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I have a uh, degree in music education from Miami University. I'm a percussionist. <clears throat> and uh, part of the music education degree, we all had to pass a piano proficiency exam. And so out of, out of that experience, I started doing, um, exercising my fingers and my hands to help me play piano better which led to this whole idea called Finger Fitness, uh, which I've got five videos out, which I'll be explaining. And um, so it's kind of thinking of yourself as a small muscle athlete. And when you, <laughs> I think that's a really good, good idea. I mean, you know, that what we do is very athletic. And so I looked at this as a way to condition my hands. Um, I also, early on after I graduated, I, uh, I play, I'm a percussionist, play the vibraphone. I started with the, um, a company called um, Cat, and Cat, the Mallet Cat. And uh, we developed the first electronic instruments and I've been in the music industry for, for about 30 years and I'll involve quite a bit in the last 20 years in China doing consulting with some of the top percussion companies. And that's where John and I got to hang out in Beijing the last time in Shanghai, it was great. It was, it was. And the, the first time we met, actually, we were talking about is in the, at the NAM show in Nashville. Yep. And you, you came up to our booth and you started doing some finger, like ballet thing. And then you handed, yeah. <laughs> and then you gave us these things. Yeah. The, of the fiddlings. Yeah, the fiddlings. So I, I've, had, I've had these since then. That's about, about three or four years now. But uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is overcoming uh, physical challenges. You know, when I was in high school, I was a trumpet player. I was a really good trumpet player, actually. And in my senior year, uh, we were playing an orchestra, 
and I noticed that I couldn't blow my horn. Like right in the middle of a song, all of a sudden, my air was just escaping out of the corner of my mouth. And I panicked. I called my mom. She took me straight to the doctor. And uh, I had Bell's palsy. And so that was pretty much the end of my trumpet career. I, uh, it was a good thing that I caught it early. But uh, my embouchure was never quite the same. And uh, so today we were wanting to talk about some, you know, physical challenges that we've all encountered. And everyone kind of knows Chuck's story, but Chuck, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience? Uh, well, uh, first, let with, me start you know, first. back uh, about ten years ago, and how you and Randall got together and and, and did your, you know, recovery and all that. Well, first, let me go back to you, uh, which we can talk, talk about. Yeah. You know, okay. when you have something like that and you're a trumpet player and you find that you have Bell's palsy, your mindset was to move on because you're a musician. Your heart is there. Yeah. So you moved on and you became a drummer, became an arranger. Mm -hmm. you, know, you became a bass player, a guitar player, which I admire you for. Mm -hmm. But the mindset has a lot to do with recovery, even if you can't use your lips anymore. You know, I was originally a trumpet player also. And the ambush is very important. Yeah. But like for me, I had a major stroke. Um, and the things that I think about when I started thinking about that stroke, it took my voice away for about, I couldn't talk for about six months. Now my will and my mindset though had a lot to do with, with recovery. And for musicians, I had good insurance. I've always been a company man working for the union. Of course I did other things too outside, but I was always a union man, which provided me being on a lot of contracts to where I had good health insurance. Uh, because if you don't have the kind of health insurance, not that I had, but there was probably better health insurance, but the insurance that I had enabled me to be um, in, in rehab uh, after ICU uh, for, for close to a year as an inpatient and then coming home being an outpatient, but insurance paid for all that. But along with all that was my mindset. I was paralyzed on the left side of my body, which was very, took a long time to recover fully. And I'm still not there. Now, it doesn't show. Everybody tells me, show, but I know inside. This is a, left side of my body is very weak, not as strong as it was. But because I've used my hands for so many years, uh, I never really lost control, although weak. And things would happen. And then meeting Randy at camp uh, a few years back, I was telling him about the problem I was having here. I thought that maybe it was arthritis, which I do, going back to mindset, have arthritis for the last 30 years right in here. But it never affected my plane. But I had it. They could see it through x-ray. They could see it. So here, I was wondering if I had it. And so Randy and I talked many, many times about exercises to do. Um, and, um, as it turned out, I went to Japan and the acupuncture said that I was exercising wrong. Mm -hmm. I was over exercising my hand. Now this is uh, probably Randy after we had our situation, I'm sort of skipping over, but the mindset has a lot to do with recovery. Um, Greg, my father lost his, uh, on his left hand, he lost these three fingers in the middle. Oh my God. However, until the day he died, he always would say that he felt them. They were already there, which means that there's some kind of attachment from, from the, from the, uh, from the hand that makes those fingers still seem like they're there. Yeah. He could feel heat there, although there was no finger. Like so, ghost, ghost, like ghost fingers. Yeah. Kind of? And like yeah. going back to me, I don't want to re elaborate too much, but uh, for Greg and for Randy, you know, like with Randy, I'll go back to where we talked about, it was, I think Randy was over a year, I was complaining about this and we were talking about different things. Yeah, we and, took glucosamine too. And then finally, yeah. I remember you asking me, how was I sleeping? Right. And what I was doing when I sleep, I curl. Put the hands and, like this. Yeah didn't realize it. And so when I woke up, whatever the muscle was, so I stopped sleeping that way. 
And I remember in later in telling you that I found a problem about my hand being that way. Yeah. Common sense sometimes does help us. <laughs> uh, yep. uh, even when it comes to robotics, if you believe mm. that a robotic attachment to your body, if you believe it, the mind will have you believing it. If my dad know that the fingers are gone, but he still feels heat, he feels he feels them. Sure. Um, um, so uh, I was really looking forward to hearing uh, a great talk about, uh, of, especially for people who have had serious consequences with their body, but they recovered, and those that don't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're all different, although we're made of the same thing. But we're all different. Some people survive because of the mindset. And I think that my mindset had a lot to do with my recovery, as well as talking to people who were saying things that I was going, well, really? You know, that kind of way. But common sense has a lot to do with it, too. Like uh, uh, robotics, you know, has a lot. I believe that there are people that are two, three hundred years old, but their whole body is made up of something else. <laughs> Not flesh and blood. So that's about all about my story. And it took me, that was uh, nine years ago. And it took me um, about a year, no, maybe two years to come back to playing comfortably. Because there's memory here. I just had to get the muscles back because everything was just frozen when I had the stroke. <clears throat> There's a lot of time too, a lot of things too about that is the time that you spent not exercising what you've been doing, the mind sort of gets stale. You gotta stay in, in thought about what you're doing. And I think the love for playing that instrument, for playing the bass kept me, it took nine years, but I'm back. Now inside, I'm not back the way that I was, but nobody knows that. Maybe when I talk, cause I had to go through about seven years of voice rehabilitation. Stephanie lady worried me to death. <laughs> <laughs> but it took seven years to be able to talk without getting tired. Mm. And also to working on saying certain things that I freely said before. Now sometimes I have to, well, most of the time I got to think about it before I say it, if it's going to be clear. Right. You know, so I'm going to stop talking. But that's my little short story to all you people who, I, I mentioned to John, I'll say one more thing. I was, <clears throat> I was living in New York. I remember a band came up to play uh, a, a club on the off night of the club, which was the Monday night. And the bass player only had a stub, not even a full thumb, on his right hand. But he was playing that bass. <laughs> playing that bass. And he wasn't slapping, right? He was like actually plucking. Actually plucking and playing, but he would hit it every now and then. I've also seen on um, Facebook pictures of a guy that had no hands. He's playing the piano with his nose. <laughs> Stuff like that. That's I remember the, one, the Venice Beach one day and watching a guy that could not speak, but he was playing, check this out, the bass with his feet. He had a drumstick tied to the, to his forearm and then and the snare was on his back and he would hit this <laughs> like that. And, <laughs> And he played the guitar, but he couldn't speak. You know, I've seen so many people, uh, a man that's 40 years old, but he talks and acts like he's three. An excellent bass player. Wow. He talks like a three-year-old, and that's where his mind is. He's a special child, but he's 43. Mm. So I know that life is wonderful, and all these things can be overcome if the mindset is right. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration, because in a, in a sense, the hand is the most beautifully complex and powerful tool not invented by him with Walt Whitman. <clears throat> we invented everything else, but not the hand. So if you think about it, there's just so many ways the hand can move. It's pretty much in this direction, moving your fingers down, making a fist, or splitting your fingers. Everything else is kind of a variation on that. So in college, I thought if I could isolate my fingers to play the piano better, that's where it kind of starts off one at a time. And then 
two at a time. So you can just bend your first two and your last two, your inside and your outside, and then every other finger. And then you can bend three at a time and so forth. Um, so some people not bend their little finger down. I think that's part of this is hereditary. Just go as far as you can down, but just trying to key into this individual finger movement. Isolating natural movements is what finger fitness is about. Now, the next movement is splitting your fingers as far as you can. All your fingers. And then if you isolate this movement, there's just four ways you can do it. You can split your finger out this way, that way, the inside, or the outside. So those are the basic movements. <clears throat> and I take what I call bending and splitting. Those are the first two. And if you put your hands together and just simply fold your fingers, keep my thumbs up on this one, and just folding back and forth. This is kind of a in between folding and slightly splitting your fingers. And I'm just going to go through this real fast. So I'll slow it down later. But again, just folding your fingers one at a time. <laughs> and two at a time. So this is the first two in the last two. The inside fingers or the outside fingers or every other finger like this. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so the inside and the outside or every, oops, every other finger like that. Or you can just leave w one finger up and do the rest. So that's triple. Whoa. The most um, interesting, the inter the interesting thing that I see about that is, and like Victor Wooten also stresses this at his camp, is that all those finger movements, you see this muscle working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Randy, you know what he does with this muscle, you know, the, the opening and closing. The muscle. This muscle controls what's happening here. That's what I had to overcome. But my whole over, uh, overcoming it had to do with acupuncture, which my doctors did not believe in it. I did it when I went to Japan. Hmm. And mm -hmm. an immediate difference, you know, the, the, you know, the acupuncture that I had. But I noticed that even when you play, this muscle, you see the muscle controlling the fingers. I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's what I just did. Oh. It makes that Here's a question. So, and we've talked about this too, Chuck, before about this muscle all the way coming from the shoulder yeah that we don't realize how much is up here and maybe i don't know randall i mean you can tell me i mean is the shoulder involved in the finger movement well uh so a lot going on here the answer is yes um some of the time when you are performing repetitive motions over and over again uh, this is what causes inflammation and tendonitis type of things. However, different symptoms come from different places. For example, if you overdo activity with your wrist and you have it bent in a certain way and too much, that's going to uh, cause carpal tunnel, ulnar tunnel, tendonitis, things like that. But working its way up, when it goes into the forearm, many times it's just going to be tightness in these muscles that you need to loosen up, which is going to take care of the problems in the wrist. Um, so when we're doing all these exercises and things, um, many times I think when people go through therapy, what they try and do is strengthen problems. But if you go into a therapy, unless it's post-surgical or post-stroke uh, or something where you're actually trying to, for some reason, get back motion and activity, 
Um, I'm not huge on strengthening necessarily just for the sake of doing it, because if you've got some, a repetitive motion that's causing uh, a buildup and can cause a possible tendonitis, and then by strengthening, you do exercises or activities to do that more, you're now sort of building that habit in and that habit becomes more than normal. And then you have this problem more of the time than not. So it's more about catching it and loosening these things up to Chuck's point, the flexors and extensors in the arm because these muscles work against each other. Flexion is going to stretch extension. Extension is going to stretch flexors. So you have to work on everything. And when you overuse a certain part, that extends to another part of the body shoulder, upper back, neck, et cetera, et cetera. There's certain circumstances, John, where the problems start up here. Uh, the uh, perhaps holding the instrument on a, a thin strap, pressing down into a plexus of nerves here, or problems with tightness in the neck and shoulder musculature, pressing on nerves, which then go down into the forearm and hand. So it's different circumstances. So that's why I'm interested in this uh, finger product because it looks to be different than just strengthening for the sake of it, which um, I've, had, I've had two notable bass players that have talked about strengthening uh, over the years. And Chuck, you've talked about it, uh, about strengthening to keep your hands in really good shape so that you can play for long periods of time. And then Stanley Clark talked about uh, squeezing tennis balls to get uh, the strength up in his hands. Now, neither one of these guys am I going to uh, contradict because obviously it <laughs> works pretty good for them. But as a general rule, the, the squeeze the ball, squeeze the putty, that kind of thing that's meant for a rehab situation. And then there's this uh, trumpet-like device too that you can use to, again, strengthen, build up, et cetera, et cetera. Or there's finger weights that I've seen that you actually put little weights on your fingers and then you're supposed to take them off and then you can play faster that kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in, uh, in Greg's view on all this and his product. Um, based yeah, on that. So because what's interesting to me, whenever I've seen, what I, what I noticed about Greg's stuff, <clears throat> it's about flexibility, mostly. Flexible mm -hmm. and, and being healthy, because something Greg, uh, Greg, you could talk more about this. Um, the, yeah, the, last, the, the last couple of DVDs and, and, and books and videos I've seen of Greg's, they were focused, uh, uh, I guess, on younger people and magicians and musicians. But right now he's he's working on a, a new video for senior citizens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to keep their, their, their flexibility and their hands healthy because what you said, Greg, was, man, if, you, if you're a senior citizen and you can't open your prescription. Right, right. You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, let me, I'll, I'll finish just my qu summary real quick so you understand everything. Bending your fingers, folding your fingers, splitting your fingers. Another one I didn't talk about is tapping your fingers. It works the extensors. Um, another one is just pushing your fingers back and forth. These are like... These are like push-ups and sit-ups and jumping jacks for your hands, how I break it down, um, splitting your fingers. Um, then there's two other exercises I do, of like this is what I call shuffling, which is a little more advanced. But what I do, what I've been thinking about creating this new, um, new program for what I call hand fitness for life. And it's thinking about what do you need, it's almost like with your body, you need strength, you need flexibility and limberness, and you need coordination. Those are the three major exercise groups. There's also aerobic exercise and balance, but you can incorporate finger fitness in those. But so what finger fitness focuses on, or hand health in a sense, is your strength, your limberness, and your hand coordination and your finger coordination. So what I'm thinking is, is first, taking your fist 
and just squeezing it for three seconds. One, about 30, 30% 30 when you're just starting out to get a feel for it, hold it for three to five seconds. So you just would go one, two, three, and then slowly just opening up your hand, maybe six seconds, and then the opposite, flex back, one, two, three. So the idea of working your flexors, I mean your, yeah, your, um, I'm sorry, extensors, right? And then opening your flexors. And then you could do this with two hands, slowly, and then opening. Um, the, to, something else you can do for strength is if you got some socks around, I got my Batman socks. But you know, you could just, the idea is you could add on to get very high quality exercise tools. If you just got some socks, the same kind of thing, three seconds, five seconds with both hands. Um, that's what I'm suggesting for strength. Um, for limberness, let's get back to finger fitness because it goes across all of this strength, limberness, and dexterity. So hold it, bend, or, or fist, and then back together. So you just go bend, up, bend, up. And then the next one would be tap, tap. So bend, up, tap, tap. So doing these two exercises, you're working the extensors and the flexors. And the other one, this time when you go up, the, the movement of fold, your fingers fold, fold. And then back to a fist. And then this time when you come up, the last one is push, push. So if I work those three together, bend up, and then you go tap, tap, push, push, bend, up, actually, here's how, I, here's how I do it to make sure I got this right, John. Just a second. So I go bend, up, fold, fold, tap, tap, push, push. If you can remember those four, bend, up, fold, fold, tap, tap, push, push, bend, fold, tap, push. Better fingers takes practice. Um, ah, there you go. <laughs> those are like building blocks of finger fitness. And when you're trying to develop strength or flexibility, you really push on these fingers going back and forth. Um, then once you understand bend, fold, tap, push, it's real simple. It's the math, singles and doubles. So you take your hands, just bend up, fold, fold, tap, tap push, push, bend, up, fold, fold. And then you just proceed down all your fingers real slow. And at first, obviously, it takes a while muscle memory to develop. But those four exercises are really great, especially for kids, developing fine motor skills, the riding the bus. You want them to shut up back there? <laughs> I was actually a substitute teacher for about five years back in the 80s when I got out of college. I didn't really know what I was wanted to do and I was developing finger fitness. And I used to tell the kids, if you can show me a trick, I haven't seen before, I'll give you a dollar. And so a lot of these exercises are kind of like uh, junior high tricks on a professional level, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, um, that's been fold, tap, push. That's mainly the finger fitness exercises. And if you don't have any exercise tools around, just having some socks. I also like kind of a, a spongy ball, which is kind of good, especially if you're older. Um, a tennis ball, if you're a little bit more of a, um, you know, in, in pretty good strength. And I think Randy mentioned before, this is called the bear grip. This is the one I like the best. And um, this is where obviously you can just actually show you a little bit better. You can just squeeze one at a time, kind of what I was just showing you before, and then you can apply the, 
doubles and the triples to this. And um, one thing is that is nice about the bear grip, you can kind of turn this so you can tighten it from say, I think this one's from three, three to five pounds so you can change the fingers. Um, and there's several different, like this one's uh, I think the extra light and this is maybe the heavy one. There's five different models. So if you're really serious about it, you know, as musicians usually are, um, this is a great product, the Berry Grip. Um, limberness, uh, besides the finger fitness stuff, this is kind of a cool thing. You got some golf balls around. <laughs> this is so simple, but just ro rotating these around in your hands. And that's what I wanted to make sure. I wanted people just to be able to do this with ordinary objects. Um, around this way, kind of hard to show you, I guess, the other way. And then you want to see if you can do it where they, they don't touch. That takes a little bit of practice there. Whoops. All right, so golf balls, if you don't have anything else, and also with spheres, I really like, I really like, like doing this type of an exercise. It really massages your hands and work supposedly like toxins or whatever builds up in those joints can help push those out. Um, John, you know, I've been going to China for a while. I went over there in the beginning for these. Right. And again, if golf balls are pretty good. Uh, even stone marbles are gonna work well, but the, uh, the metal Chinese therapy wall, ball ones um, are the ones that I really like. But, you know, I just the, since we're trying to give people a little eye candy now and then. Uh, but really, <laughs> just being able to rotate these around in your hands one way, and usually the thumb side is the easier way, and then the other way, those two things. And most people, I think, if you have a stroke, even you can help you know, assist with the other hand. Um, and I think a lot of times, when you say if you have a stroke in your right hand and learning this activity in your left hand and then putting it in your right hand, I think there's some transfer. I mean, I wanted to see what Chuck thinks about that, but sometimes developing a, an exercise in this hand will transfer pretty well over here. Um, so those are the, some of the key things. Oh, I forgot my favorite uh, little rubber band. Um, working the extensors, you know, you could just kind of, hold yourself and some of these things real simple isometrics back and forth but again a simple rubber band uh, there's all kinds of little fun things you can do with it hopefully i won't make it fly off do this kind of a thing and just just like this and um everybody's natural ability depending on how old you are if you've had any injuries um, um, arthritis so this isn't too bad this is pretty good but let's see here if you really want to do it right this is a really cool product by Daddario whoops called the constant force my god dude what is this this is uh <laughs> this looks like torture <laughs> this gives you a um, continuous I don't know if you can see that very well these are, gives you continuous tension. And uh, I really like, uh, this is, you know, top of the line um, called Constant Force. And this is also by Daddario. So that's true. You, you saw it, and oh, the last thing is um, that I've been kind of putting together, <clears throat> promoting strength, limberness, and dexterity and co coordination, obviously the finger fitness will help that. This is called a fiddling. And my friend developed this and you simply turn it inside out and it's like a um, fidget toy that develops finger dexterity. So that's um, what I have like a hand musicians package. Um, so that's, that's the whole concept. I've been doing this for a little over 30 years. I've got finger video, finger exercise videos for children's, for beginners, for advanced, 
for the Glovers who developed those exercises with lights. So I hope that uh, gives you an idea without t talking too much. That's crazy. You know, like I really um, appreciate that because like in my first therapy, I did a lot of that. <clears throat> also a lot of other things too, was uh, to improve strength. If you're a musician though, I always say, if you're like a bass, if you're a bass player in particular, maybe a guitar player or a piano player too, that if you put your hands on the instrument and play the instrument, it does the same thing. Because you gotta have, not the same thing now, but it does another kind of thing for the instrument along with what you just described. It was all those things I needed to do. You know, I needed to do it. Uh, and it kind of helped, but I overdid it. And when, in Japan, the, uh, the acupuncturist told me that I was, my, all my muscles were too tight. And she could tell that I was in rehab, doing rehab stuff, and I was overdoing it. And she said, you're a musician. What instrument do you play? I said, bass. She said, that's your main therapy playing scales because this has to connect with this has to connect with this right you can't always have the instrument so when you're on a plane and when you're doing uh you know uh, traveling or just sitting and just sitting listening in church a lot of these things that you're mentioning are very very good because if you've had a stroke and you've lost that on this side of the body you need as much memory to come back to the hands as possible you know but i'll always tell people that I haven't been that much, but when people ask me, I said, my best therapy was putting my hands on the bass and making notes. Because you gotta keep time, you gotta play the right note, you gotta do what you gotta do. But there's also too, if you're a bass player, to do all the things that Greg, you're saying, depending on what you like. Some of the stuff that you mentioned, I didn't care for. You know, but they were working my butt off so hard in rehab that I had to do what they wanted me to do because I did believe that they were helping me. But one thing I didn't do, although when I left in-house rehab, uh, she had told me that for the last few sessions to bring my bass, which at the time I couldn't even play a note. I, couldn't, I didn't have the pressure. And she said, that's why we're building the muscle up. But well, then once I got home and I was an outpatient, I began to play the bass a little bit more. And when I went to Japan, she stuck so many needles in me, guys. I, I, I you know, at least 200 needles, a 200, a, a two hour session. That's crazy. And, but it did help relieve a lot of, uh, especially here, down into here. Whoa, 200 needles? Yep, two hour session. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, not like a pin cushion. <laughs> and she was an old lady. <laughs> oh, she had to have been at least 70. Oh my God. That's rich. And so like it's very, very interesting that all musicians, I wouldn't say just bass players, but really we have two bass players here, three actually, or John plays the bass. You do have to have control with the hand that's fingering the notes. Mm -hmm. If you're right-handed, this hand has to be strong enough to connect with this hand. Mm -hmm. So when this hand goes boom, this hand has to be doing something to coincide with it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of musicians, I'll say guys, this and, and, and girls, when you have a stroke or you lose a limb, it takes a while for your mindset to recover. It takes a while. But you gotta have trust in the universe giving you, especially when you see other people who have less than you mm. doing what you want to do and all you got to do is be paying attention but they have a heartfelt religious attitude about what you do and if it's music music will support you so all these things that i've heard from you greg and of course from you randy a lot of musicians just give up <clears throat> there was a guy an upright player uh, up in cleveland who had a massive stroke in his 60s. I'm ashamed to say I can't tell his name. But a friend of mine that I went to school with, I knew he had the stroke, I knew of him, but he was like 65. And the stroke stopped him completely. He couldn't talk, he was paralyzed. He says, Chuck, you ought to see him now. And he plays the upright bass. 
Oh, wow. You know, you got to have more strength to play. That finger, finger, finger exercises and ability are very important. When I look at people like Richard Bono play, amazing. What he does with a light touch, but with, with, you know, with the connection. When I watch Christian McBride play it upright, it's amazing. Mm. You know, where, when you try and do what they do, it's finger coordination. You know, with the both hands. <clears throat> and either they play that instrument so much and for many, many years, but there are good bass players that play well and they have not been playing that long. You know, like I mentioned, I think before earlier, a guy is 40 years old, but he's mentally challenged in that he talks and sounds like he's three. But he's a hell of a bass player. There's something going on that is no matter what we lose, something can connect if our mindset believes that the universe, if we're musicians or whatever it is that we are, you know, like musicians that cannot hear, but they can play with a band. Yeah, that's always weird, isn't it? That's very, very weird. <laughs> they can oh, feel the vibrations in the floor and stuff like that. Or blind people who can't see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Although if you play in a fretless instrument, you don't have to look once you get used to where it is and how it is. But people who have, they can't talk, but they can play. Or they can talk, but they can't hear. You know, like it does happen. You just got to have a mindset to believe that uh, we humans are very, very smart. Those of us figure out how to do things and others, that's what their expertise is. And you have others who are good at this and good at that. And it's great to pay attention to what everybody is saying, especially if they're your friend, you know, and you know that what they're saying is heartfelt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, musicians, uh, I feel for them. Not so much because of the pandemic, but the, we're a special breed of people. Yeah. Now, some of us are smart and we get a day job. <laughs> 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 Because it ain't all peaches and roses unless you're fortunate to be at the right place and doing the right thing. And even that takes time, mm -hmm. trial and error. You know, so like, uh, that was very, very, very good. I really like that a lot. Randy, I look at the book all the time because I'm always nosy about what connects to what and how it works out. I look at a guy like Victor Wooten, who I've always considered a power ranger. Victor can jump much higher than his height. I've seen him do it. And Randy, you may have too. Sure. Uh, Victor is also able to do things and he's physically fit. He's a little bull, you know, <clears throat> his forearms are huge, but he had a lot of mental activity along with his talent. You know, he had a, a, a his mother was great. Dorothy was a great woman but... and his mindset has always had him thinking that he can do it if he thinks he can do it. And he has all of his philanthropies. Is that the right word? Yeah. yeah. He has them all. So he's not impaired. Um, but those of us that have been impaired, it's a trial tribulated in the hard road to come back. Because the mind, uh, the brain reminds them of what they used to do rather than listen to the mind that says you can do it again if we did it once. Like my daddy feeling three fingers that are not there. Well, this is true. And uh, and there's a lot of science that, that backs up certain things that we've been talking about that is easily uh, found out if you start digging into it. Um, one thing about the Wootens is, uh, and knowing Dorothy and knowing the brothers, Nobody ever told them, no, you can't do this from the beginning. So they didn't have that built into them to feel that they were limited to do some certain things in my estimation. <laughs>